Ah! Oh. You might do your best and you get all the way up to the level of jerk still. Podcast Junkies, episode 103, season two. We're back this week with P. Desmond Adams. Desmond, as he's known to his friends. He's got a great podcast called Mental Mastery, and he's been doing it for several years now. It's just a fantastic uh, podcast um, on how, we, how to have a powerful mindset and really achieve mental mastery. But to be honest, we <laughs> didn't talk that much about the podcast, and we talked more about him and his life and what got him to this point and what the heck took him so long to come on the show. I think he had doubts about whether he was going to provide value and he was wondering why I would even want to ask him, which is ridiculous because it was a fantastic conversation and really touching at points. And I think uh, I just love the fact that you can get to know more about the guests when they come on the show because I just, I'm open to cover any topic we head into. And this time was no exception. So let's get right into it. Uh, my interview with uh, Desmond, in case you missed last week, we spoke to Hernan Lopez of Wondery Media. Check that one out. He's the host, not the host, sorry, the, the founder and CEO of Wondery, a fantastic new network that's doing really good things. Check out their shows at wondery.com and stay tuned towards the end of the show for a retention hashtag. If you're new to the show, the, the retention hashtag is what I have as a little Easter egg at the end of the episode, and it's a way for regular listeners to tweet about the fact that they listen to the end and it's something that my loyal fans do and I'm forever grateful. So if you want to be part of that super cool club, then do that. We've got a new sponsor for the show. It's called Pod Funnel, and uh, I'll let you know a little bit more about that about at the end as well. But for now, more Desmond, less Harry. Less, less Harry. I think I, less, I said less Harry. Never mind. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. Good to be here. <laughs> Finally, right? You rolled out the red carpet. We just didn't know it was so long. Been what walking is... down that red carpet for a year and a half. <laughs> How did you... I know we connected through Jeff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jeff Brown. But uh, how, how do you know Jeff? Jeff Brown and I, actually, we've worked in radio together. So he's got that golden radio voice. Yes, uh, he does. Yeah, so I don't. Um, so he was a lead on a morning show. It was uh, Jeff and Marcy, I think. I was a sidekick, a goofy, silly sidekick. Not on his show, but on a show that replaced us. Not because he got fired. I have to make sure I stipulate that. Because he didn't want to wake up that early anymore. So our show here in West Palm in South Florida took over the network as well. And so, and then Jeff and I, he ran the Nashville radio station. I ran the South Florida radio station. So we both had the exact same roles, uh, two different locations. So we, we worked a lot together. And when we get together, we'd all geek out about pod. He and I would geek out about podcasting while they all talked about radio. So what was, what was the role you guys had? I'm the operations director. I still am. And, uh, operations director, that's what he did. So I ha handle all of the, um, oddly all of the operations so it's everything other than the finances which again oddly i should have read into that they don't trust me with money <laughs> so everything that you hear on the radio station other than what the air talent's saying between songs that's based in nashville so that comes across satellite um and uh, i don't schedule the music There's really not much i do now that i think about it <laughs> if the mic breaks or these headphones need to be replaced i order them that's it i think that's what it comes down to is that is that the stuff that's in your wheelhouse? Uh, no. Oh my gosh, you you you're gonna we're gonna go deep right away, aren't we, Harry? <laughs> I am a performer, and when I was a little kid, I loved doing magic and ventriloquism and juggling. I'd go to Balboa Park in San Diego, and I'd watch, uh, you know, I'd watch all that stuff, and I wanted to do that, but I had stage fright, and I didn't think I had a radio voice. So it wasn't until I was in my early 30s that I made the jump and got into radio. I was working as an engineer and. Honeywell, a big company. Oh yeah. Anyway, my dad so I got used to work for Honeywell. You do? Oh no, my cousin. My cousin or, used to. Oh, your yeah, cousin. Oh, okay. So yeah. 
it's boring. And you worked in the lab. I worked in the lab and then in an office. And I worked with all these PhDs who would write these math formulas up on the wall. And I would just nod my head and go, yeah, we should try that. <laughs> and I had to act like I knew what they were talking about because I was an engineer. And so um, I, I don't have an engineering degree. I just had worked my way up to that point. Anyway, I love being a goofball. I love making people laugh. I love, I love the little zingers. They used to call me on the show. My program director used to say, you're the, you're the um, punctuator because anytime somebody would say something, I'd always come in with a boom. I love being a co-host because here's the beauty of it. If you're the host, you got to lead the show. Yeah. You better come up with something interesting from here until we're done. If I happen to think of something funny, I can chime in. Otherwise, I can sit quietly and wait for you to finish things up. I love that role. And so I, and now now I don't do on air as much at traffic and weather stuff. And it's not not as much opportunity to be funny when there's a car accident. Not as much, but there still is. Um, and so I, I miss that. That's part of the reason I love podcasting. I just would love to do a funny show. How deep did you get down the performer track with all everything that you were being inspired by in Balboa Park. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, um, I had a lot of stage fright. I was a little kid, a little freckle face, a little Opie, you know, Opie and, uh, uh, yeah, whatever. Do, do, do. The Andy anyway. Griffith show. Andy Griffith show. That was, I was going to whistle the theme song. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I messed up. Sorry. <laughs> you led the way though. You did a good job. Um, <laughs> that's it. Show our um, age with that one. Yeah, I didn't think you were my age. I still don't. But um, so I, I was this little freckle faced little kid, scrawny kind of. Didn't really, um, you know, didn't have a lot of confidence about myself, and so uh, I had a lot of stage fright. And so I would perform magic for friends and family at family gatherings and stuff. And of course, they were family. You could make a mistake, and they'd be like, "Oh, that was cute. They were really nice and everything." But I just didn't really have it in me to to get up on stage. I never did a talent show for it or any. I just kind of was a you know shrunk away into the corner of the room. And if somebody asked, I would then show them a trick or something. Um, uh, but so I I did start putting together an audition. I wanted to join the Magic Castle. It's in Hollywood. There we close to where you are. So I wanted to join the Magic Castle. So I had I had been a member of the International Brotherhood. <laughs> this is going to sound really geeky. International Brotherhood of Magicians That's the and the S Society of American Magicians. So those two big organizations in the United States where all the geeks who don't have girlfriends go and hang out and talk about magic. <laughs> it's true. And, um, so I, I, that's, that's about as far as I got. I, I, you know, I read a book called showmanship for magicians. It helps a lot with my radio work and with podcasting a lot about how to deliver things, uh, in a, in time things and when to bail out. Like now I probably should bail out on this story. <laughs> I knew that. So my mind works out. <laughs> so that was it. I didn't go too deep with it. What, who was, who were you from? So from the magic side, cause I, I dabbled in, in magic as well. Oh, yeah. And I was, uh, yeah, I mean, little like just the books, and I would always be fascinated when you'd go to Disney and you'd see the the magic, magic shop. shop, and you'd have these yeah. little tricks, and you'd, and you'd kind of play with them. And then I, you know, learned basic. I did some card tricks for like my little sister or little brother's mm -hmm. uh, birthday party a couple times. So yeah. yeah, dabbled in it, and it was it's fun. And you know, I was fascinated with Harry Houdini. Mm -hmm. um, I think I read his biography, and just I'm wondering if you were drawn to any specific magicians. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a guy named Di Vernon. Did you hear the name Di Vernon before? Okay. Uh, he, he's kind of a magician's magician where Harry Houdini had, he, he was really good at publicity. Di Vernon, um, actually was friends with Harry Houdini, uh, but he was a master, um, with sleight of hand. And I really, really admired, uh, his skills. He, he's again, a magician's magician. You know, there's musicians, musicians, and then there's pop stars. Uh, Harry yeah, Houdini yeah. was more of a pop star type Performer, of magician. Yeah. 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 And so Di Vernon was more about the technique kind of, you could watch a, you know, there are some musicians who can, could not write a pop song, but the technique, amazing. Uh, you know, they just don't have that broad appeal. So that's the way Di Vernon was. Um, and so I really, really liked what he did. Um, of course, I grew up in the time of Doug Henning. 
You remember Doug Henning in the afro, and he kind of rainbow pants, late seventies, right? Doesn't and get more seventies than Doug. <laughs> that's, yeah, the rainbow, uh, the the spandex shirts and all that. I, I really liked him, but I think he went to Tibet or something. He really got into mysticism, like really wanted to no longer do tricks. He actually wanted to really levitate. Um, so I don't know if he ever did, but I liked him a lot. Um, I loved vaudeville. I would watch old reruns of vaudeville on TV yeah. on channel five KTLA. That was, uh, that's, that's how we had to watch it in San Diego. We had to get an LA station. Um, and so I, I yeah, I, I love that. Um, the local magicians that I, there was actually a magician who worked. Do you know San Diego at all? There's Belmont park. There's a roller a coaster bit. down in mission beach, that roller coaster on the beach. Yeah. Well, that used to be an amusement park back when, you know, I was a little kid and there, this is how I got into magic. The magician who worked at an amusement park came to my elementary school and, um, and, and did a little show, you know, in the auditorium, I was in first grade, I was uh, not reading very well. And I was kind of about to get held back because I couldn't read very well. And so I saw this magician. I said, I want to do that. And so I begged my mom and we went to the library and I got a stack of probably 10 magic books and I brought them home. And between the pictures and the words, I learned how to read in the course of that one year where I was up to grade level, all because of magic, wanting to learn how to do magic tricks and be a performer. So, But that's interesting, right? Because if more parents or teachers took that approach of mm -hmm. putting kids in that that uh, channel of enthusiasm for the subject matter, you know, that's the reason why you jumped headfirst into that because it was a topic that you obviously wanted to read about. Yeah, definitely. I've always been a strong advocate of that. Um, just my, you know, my daughter was really into doing hair when she was younger and she ended up becoming a stylist and I always championed that. That's a little bit easier than when it comes to the creative arts uh, there's just this notion that, well, you're never going to make a living doing that. And you're certainly not going to live at the house until you're 30. So you better figure out what you're going to do for a living. Uh, so you got to get into real books, but yeah, I, I think that's definitely the case. It's just such a different world now where, you know, if you want to learn magic, now you go to YouTube, it's not, you're not going to the library, grabbing a stack of books. We didn't, I mean, we barely had four channels on, boy, I sound old. <laughs> <laughs> start kind of appeal to your younger demographic. <laughs> um, what's interesting that what I've noticed um, since in the in the couple of times we've been to in interact in person, and then even the, there's a couple of moments on this call. There's there's an aspect of you that's self deprecating, like, oh. and, and I'm and I'm wondering like why that is, and if it's something that you've you've noticed yourself. How deep do you want to go, Harry? <laughs> we'll start somewhere and then we'll just see where it goes. <laughs> yeah. You know what I think it is when you're that, I mentioned earlier, I was that scrawny little freckle, freckle face little kid. And, um, you know, I, I, I grew up in a neighborhood. I lived there for quite a while in the same neighborhood. So we'd go play football and baseball, but I was, I was always kind of the last guy on the backstop. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'll take John. I'll take Steve. I'll take. Uh, I guess we'll take him right there. You, whatever, whoever you are, just come on. You know, I'm the last guy. So that starts to sink in. And when you're not a big guy and you can't fight, you have one other thing that you can do, and that's be funny. Yeah. And so I would beat him to, the, I'd be funny and beat him to the punch instead of them insulting me. I'd insult myself in a funny way. And they were like, ah, this kid's fun. He's cool. You can hang around with us. And that's uh, how I got to hang around with all the stoners. So, <laughs> <laughs> but there's an, the, do you have you seen a change in culture in the way we have an appreciation or um, an opportunity to have those type of personalities not feel like they're being ostracized? Has the culture changed in that way? Um, uh, no, I think I think uh, I think things are the same. I just think there's just a different vessel that it's going through now. It's a Snapchat. It's a social media thing, and um, you know, you can, I get, I guess there's less, ah, oh man, I'm, I'm kind of vacillating on this because there's less oper there's less need to be creative, to be funny. You know, I couldn't just be funny by reading a joke book, but nowadays on Snapchat or on Facebook or Instagram, or whatever, you could share a funny meme and you could be the guy who always shares the funny memes or something like that. You don't necessarily have to be creative yourself. I say that, but at the same time, I think about the people who are doing vlogging or just doing something fun and creative on a podcast or or I don't know how many young people are podcasting. But I think it's a sliver, but vlogging's big. My granddaughter's six, seven years old. 
Papa, can we vlog this weekend? And they're just dying to vlog, you know? And um, so I think there's more opportunity to be creative at the same time. There's, there's, uh, I don't know. I don't have an answer. I, I think one of the things a that... Long I'm... non-answer. <laughs> <laughs> one, of the, uh, one of the things I was thinking about was this idea that uh, calling out kids on on bullying is is very prevalent now so it's almost like now if you're the bully you're the you get ostracized because that's not cool anymore you don't do that anymore and and I'm wondering if 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 you've seen that aspect of it manifest itself where you know that that doesn't happen as much oh, I don't I don't know man I don't know I I like I said I got pretty good at being the funny guy and and for the most part I also was in the neighborhood for a long time so you know you get a lot of long term friends that helps a lot and nowadays I think we're we're more mobile mom and dad are moving every few years and you're in a new school and that other than military that wasn't really the case years ago um but I think um I think that definitely bullying now is no longer cool. So I think it's a little more veiled now. I actually think bullying might exist more in the, uh, with women or girls than with boys, because that can seem, that's very emotionally bullying, mm -hmm. but it's not, you know, physically bullying. I mean, it's very obvious, very apparent that, oh, there's a fight over there on the sandbox or whatever. You know, nowadays with women, it's, it's just the cutting, biting comments. It's the, yeah. and, and, and a lot of times it's hidden behind social media that mom and dad don't see. And so you could have some a young girl in your house that's getting bullied emotionally, and you have no idea because there's no physical bruises or no black eye or anything like that. Like probably me, less you would come home with growing up. So mm -hmm. more more self deprecating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if the if anyone's paying attention, we'll make it a drinking game for you guys. So every time. Uh doesn't yep. get to comment. <laughs> That's so <laughs> deprecating. Right. You guys do a shot. Oh my goodness. This is I'm all for responsible <laughs> drinking. That's not what this is gonna be. Make it a half a shot. Okay. All right, half a shot. Right. So what's well, on a positive note, and this will add an opportunity, the more I'm self deprecating, the better I'll look. Okay. Right? Because as they if they look at and they drink and then I look better. Ah, yes. See what I was doing there? Yes, the beer goggles yeah. kick in. Okay. Beer. So so you were, you were talking earlier about you and Jeff talking about podcasting. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you both come at it, do you think, at the same time or, and you were discovering the same shows or, or you had some that you were interested in early on? Yeah, he definitely jumped into it more than I did. And I started, as a matter of fact, that's how it came up because he talked to me about podcasting. And this was probably in 09, maybe. I think 09. Uh, I had looked at podcasting back in 05, back when, you know, it wasn't in iTunes. You had to know how to create your, you had to hand code your RSS feed. What? Who does that? And so I'm looking at this stuff and I'm, I'm like a radio geek. I want to be on the radio. I want to communicate. If this had been around when I was a kid, oh my gosh, my life would have changed dramatically. Um, but yeah, so I was, I was looking at it and I'm trying to read, how do you do an RSS feed and well, how do you set up a, a recording and all this stuff? And I was like, Ugh, I'm not doing that. That's not real radio. I'm just going to stick with the real radio. Well, Jeff wasn't like that. He was intrigued with advances in technology and, you know, all these opportunities. So he jumped into it. So we were at a meeting together and he started talking about podcasts. I'm like, oh, wow, you're into that. I used to be into that a little bit. And uh, we got to talking and that, that kind of what that's kind of what led me to reinvestigate it again. Uh, so he's to blame. Drink. <laughs> uh, do you remember the earlier shows that caught your ear oh well adam uh adam curry i would listen to I, I wouldn't say it caught my ear i listened to adam curry probably did the best job there were a lot of walking talking podcasts back then like people would do a tour of the cincinnati zoo is that a zoo? yeah san diego zoo Okay. They would do things like that. Hey, I'm at the San Diego Zoo and they, they do walking, talking podcasts just with their earbuds or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, the audio quality was horrible. Adam Curry, the podfather, is that what they call him? Right? I think I think so. Um, one MTV, of them. VJ, one of the podfathers. Um, and so I, I really enjoyed his show because he, he did, he had the celebrity factor. And so you kind of, the voyeurism, you kind of got to see a little bit inside of his world. Um, and you know, honestly, I remember listening to, is it Don and Drew, right? Don and Drew, I yeah. think. 
Yeah, yeah, they won a they won a, a, an award in Chicago for a, a inductment into a Hall of Fame, um, and so. Uh, no, they and, they and great, and rightfully so, because they have. They've been there the long haul. When nobody believed it, even me, they just kept doing it. Um, podcasting, that is. I have to clarify with them. Um, so, yeah, but I, again, I, you know, I'll be honest. I listened to it, and I was such such a radio geek that I was just like, this isn't polished. This isn't, this isn't you know, this isn't what I would like to do. I want something that sounds professional and great. And I heard a lot of just rambling and you know, small talk that didn't really include me. I kind of felt outside of it. And so I bailed out on it for years and years. Um, and then I got into it and I started listening. Uh, of course, when I started listening, man, I think Pat and Cliff Ravenscraft, Pat Flynn were there. And so I started listening to that and I was really into, there was a ton of great business knowledge available. And so I love that. Well, what's interesting point that you made was the fact that you felt excluded from the conversation. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really an important one to spend a little bit of time on because as podcasters, we want to make sure that even as you and I are having a conversation, we don't forget uh, the our, my loyal listeners who I want yeah. to ensure that they're getting value every time. So I always want to make sure that the conversations I'm having, the guests that I'm having, the topics we're discussing interest me. Yes, because obviously, if they didn't, then it would be a really boring conversation. Right. <laughs> but I have to think about ways to make sure that we can tease out topics uh, in a way that they find interesting. And I think over time, people already know that my show is it can go anywhere depending on on the guest, and then depending on the slightest comment you might make about some random unicycle ride you did like four years ago. <laughs> yeah, I have a unicycle right down the hall, actually. Uh, I can bring it in. Uh, <laughs> well, hence the drinking game. Include yeah. the listeners yes. in the, in the, and if you are having the drinking game, great. Uh, uh, but yeah, that's, that's one of the things because of my radio background, because of what I originally heard in podcasting, there are certain people in the podcasting world who think podcasting should be the anti-radio. Uh, you know, I, the last thing I want my podcast sound like is a radio show because yeah. I despise radio. It's so formulaic. It's, it's again, we'll go back to the musician thing. There's musicians who the last thing I want to do is write a pop song. Well, you know, if you want to make a living at it, you're going to need to write a pop song. And then on your third album, you can kind of experiment a little bit. But first, appeal to the masses. And so that I, I kind of, I, I'm, I want to make sure that I, I always coach people to include your listeners first. I've been coached for years by the best, really. I mean, the same people who coach um, Ryan Seacrest, who coach uh, um, Jimmy Kimmel. Uh, he was my coach as well. Mm. And, um, and Randy Lane's his name. He's the best in the business. And it was always about including the listener, include the listener. And you use that in real life. So when you're talking and you're in a group setting, you may be talking one-on-one, but you see other people are watching or you're in a circle, especially at a conference or something. Look around the room and kind of look at some of you and say, you know, that may be something you dealt with. I, it, I know that sounded a little scripted, but you might say, I don't know if any of you have dealt with that too but harry here's what i did so i've wrapped them in all of a sudden so it works outside of podcasting as well what's some other it's uh how do you spell his last name randy lane you said lane yeah l-a-n-e so you you imagine if he's coaching folks of that caliber he has to be doing something right absolutely and so what are some of the other things that that stand out for you in the in the time that you spent with him you know including the listener is one, as you've pointed out, but any, anything else that, that jumps out at you that, that, that might be something that would be relevant to podcasters? When you're crafting your show, one of the things he was really big on, and we spent an entire day and a half, it really was a day and a half, we were on a, I was on a show in Spokane, Washington, and there were four of us on the show. We spent a day and a half going over uh, what are my character traits? I went by Patch on the air there because of the Adams thing. So they thought, oh, it'd be funny if we call the producer guy Patch. Huh? So that, and it was cool. I liked it. But um, so we'd go through, well, tell us about Patch. What is it? What are his likes? What are his dislikes? Oh. And so we tried to find these areas 
where there was no overlap, where I could really be who I am and appeal to a segment of our audience. And then Dave and Ken and Molly and the hosts and other co-hosts on the show, we, we tried to really find out, you know, we know that we're going to have areas where we overlap in interests and even in dislikes, but what makes me distinct on the show? So it was a lot of what you'd call casting for the show. And people don't think about that. I know there's people I listen to who have three funny people on a show and they think that's what makes a good show. That's not what it, it could have moments of funny, but if you really want a good show, you need to cast for that show in I've talked to people who were finalists on American Idol and I was kind of surprised, but then it made sense afterwards. You could be the, one of the best singers that auditions, but if they've already got a redneck hillbilly, who's a good singer, they don't need another one. So I'm sorry, you may be better than the single mom, but they need a single mom. So she's going on the show and that's the way they do it. It's casting for, so for appeal to the audience, they don't want the 20 best singers. They wanted a single mom and a redneck and, and, and somebody else who's come from a rough background or something. Appeal to the audience. That was one of the things uh, Randy would go over with us all the time. He was big into storytelling as well and camera angles. We'd always talk about camera angles. So if, Harry, you're telling a story on the show and I want to chime in, I shouldn't suddenly move the camera to me. What I should do is take the camera and move it from a different angle and keep it on your story. You know, conversations go back and forth oftentimes. Talk to somebody, say, oh, you know what? Something like that happened to me too. And all of a sudden there's this separation in the, con there's no more continuity in the conversation. You want to keep the camera angle on the same subject until there's the right opportunity for it to move to a different subject. That's just two little things. Well, it's interesting because uh, what comes to mind is the idea of, pairing the right co-hosts together on a yes. podcast because to your point there's a lot of these shows two guys in a basement mm -hmm. two gals and you know drinking cocktails yep. and it <laughs> seems i they're not attractive to me and I, and i imagine at some point they have a small audience of their friends listening but over time if it's if it's to to your point the same two personalities there's not going to be a lot of um differences in opinion and right. i think there's not there's not going to be a lot of a dynamic back and forth going on because if they're they're all laughing at the same jokes and they have the same likes it becomes almost this megaphone of just it's a rant times two <laughs> or and it's it, narrow yeah it's very it's narrow. very narrow it's just it's going to appeal only to other people of that same if you can expand that out to even with two people and you can expand that out where you have opposite um or, or different opinions that you can expand it. Not so that there's conflict. There's a difference between conflict and friendly conflict and fighting too. Uh, everybody, everybody, when you're driving down the road, everybody wants to kind of slow down and see the accident until there's a, a body covered. And then it's like, oh, you don't want to, that's, that's too far. And so you hear this, you, you'll hear, you got to have friendly conflict and tension. It's like a movie you know, Mike Kim, I don't know if you know Mike Kim, but if you're listening, you may not know Mike Kim. You can look him up. Um, he does a good job of that, teaching people how to craft your story and to follow movie formulas. Learn where the tension point is and then the resolution to the tension. There's a lot goes on in your head while you're sitting here doing a radio show. It's crazy. We used to do these exercises where we would, because um, your left brain and right brain, when you're on the air, like when you're doing your podcast, you set your levels and you leave them. Pretty much, unless somebody starts, you know, banging the meter up there. Um, that's not a dirty phrase, by the way. That's actually just the meter. Going, sorry. Um, so, um, so, so you're 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 moving things and you're moving songs into play and you're going to shift it or this around and that around on the screen. I'm moving my hands all over the place. Uh, we used to do this exercise where you would stand three people. The person in the middle had to have an imaginary uh, photo album open. Kids, that's what we used to look at pictures with, <laughs> photo albums. And uh, and then the other person was given a math problem. So you're doing left brain, right brain stuff. So I would have to explain to you my trip, family trip to Disneyland while somebody on my left side is giving me math problems. So I'd say, oh, this is when we first got to the castle, 72. And then we went over and saw Cinderella, 18. And so you're just, it's it's so hard to do sometimes. Your brain wants to explode. So, there's yeah, a there's stuff. an interesting book. Uh, I, I, every once in a while, I try to dabble in a little drawing. It's it's called mm. Drawing from the Right Side of the Brain. 
Oh, it's a yes. fascinating book because uh, guide because it really goes in the face of any of the any of the other basic uh, books on drawing. But one of the exercises is, is to draw a profile, but you draw it upside down so that you're oh. shown the face, but you're showing it upside down. And when you do, you lose that lo- that um, you know the 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 the, the the left brain, like f- trying to figure out, like where's the nose, and this is where an eye looks like, and this is what lips are supposed to look like. So if you're just drawing lines and you're just drawing a shape, and inevitably you you turn it around and, and it looks great, it looks better. Oh. It's better than if you try to draw it by replicating it right side up. I think for me it would look horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but what you're doing is at this point you're just you're just mimicking at this point like yep. a shape. You're not yeah, thinking, right. you're not thinking face 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 right. You're just thinking exactly. oh it's just a squiggly line, and then later on you realize oh I was drawing a nose. But if you're in your mind thinking I'm drawing a nose, you're like well this is not looking like a nose, and you're you know your logic kicks yeah. in and you're just like ah throws you off. So did that book come with extra sets of erasers? It did. I would think a, big, I, I... <laughs> a big fat eraser. It did. <laughs> Because that's no, that's not a nose. Yes. <laughs> erase it, erase it. I've been so. fascinated lately by uh, sacred geometry, so I've been, I've got a compass, oh. yes, a compass, and drawing like the flower of life symbols and things like that. I, rem- I remember Spirograph when I was younger. Yes. I want to get yeah. my hands on one of those because I think that's a lot of that's a lot of what yeah. it, what it did. So I think a lot of those. I feel like a lot of those toys when we were younger, they were pretty advanced. You know, you know, mm-hmm. and if you think about like those spirographs are drawing like these mandalas <laughs> yeah and you're like you know you're a young kid you have no idea what it means and if there's the you know there's a lot of these symbols that have a lot of power behind them so yeah what's it called the ratio the uh the phi ratio yeah that, Fibon- that ratio F- fibonacci fibonacci that's yeah. what it is yeah. yeah that's and i i remember designing a website for myself one time and i thought it was gonna be all kind of woo woo kind of esoteric about it and i tried to make everything kind of follow the fibonacci uh and they say that in design it's used all the time yeah, yeah, and that's what looks the best to the eye uh it's all over us in 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 nature you know the nautilus and and all of that yeah. so i i tried doing that on my site and i i, I mean i've changed it since then but you i know. did i did uh i have a, a, com- a company where i i produce podcasts for folks and I, I use a blue, a blue, dark blue has been one of my favorite colors forever. So I was looking at the the hex codes, and I was oh, like, yeah. uh, and I was like, and then I and I was thinking of Fibonacci, and so the hex code for the blue that I use is actually there's a little Fibonacci sequence. In oh, the, is there in the numbers because you know it's one one two, and it, you just uh, for the listener, it, a Fibonacci sequence is adding the previous two numbers together. Mm-hmm. So it's one plus one, then you get two, two plus one, you get three, three plus two, you get five, five plus three you get eight and then you get yep. uh, eight plus five you get 13 and so on so there's a sequence in that number that will give you a, a dark blue and that's that's the number i picked <laughs> is that your brand's color is that yeah it is my, it is my brand's color i think it's uh, whatever it is it's one one two three five eight or or the next one, number yeah, yeah so <laughs> yeah that's awesome do you think there's anything spiritual about that i mean i don't know where you are spiritually there there but... is that's probably that would have to be another podcast for me because I can go some down some serious rabbit holes. Oh, okay. Stuff like that. <laughs> I'd love to hear about that because I just don't know if they're... Well, just... what, what happens is that that sequence appears in nature, right? And, mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it, it speaks to the, um, the, call it divine order in something that's created and you start measuring it and you look at some of these plants. I mean, I've got a lot of... We live out here in California, in, in basically the desert. So you see a lot of these—I um, uh, forget what type of plants it's called—but a lot of these cactus-type plants, and then some mm-hmm. of these, the patterns on some of these plants are just absolutely beautiful, and just like these spirals. And then you just look at, yeah. like you know, like you say the the the, the shells and yep. some of these conch shells, and you turn them over. It's just, and, you, and if you measure it, it's going to have the Fibonacci sequence. And when you look at it. And you see the way it's organized, and you see like the Milky Way, the way it's organized, and you superimpose like the the spot, the, the 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 conch shell on there, and then you see like the way water like turns mm-hmm. into a spiral when it's going down the drain. That's like a consistency across all those things, and it's like you know what the reason for that is, you know, or the fact that that can happen randomly just doesn't make sense. for me. It's just not doesn't make sense. It's like there's something about it that's tying all those things together. Um, it's fascinating stuff. I mean, I'm. I, I get I, into like hieroglyphics and 
all sorts oh, really? of patterns and all sorts of stuff like that. Yeah, I'm fascinated. In all your free time. Yeah. Uh, it, it, so I think what it is, is it, it just means it, it's a good way of being in flow with nature. You're not going against the grain or against the current. The current naturally goes this way. And if you can design in the same way, it's going to be easy for people to just fall right into what you're trying to trying to design. I live on in South Florida, so we have the Gulf Stream just off the coast here. We're as close as you get to the Gulf Stream here. And um, I live in Jupiter, so it's right off there. Um, and I always tell people, like, people are always like, well, you know, I, we don't want to get too spiritual. But I always say, you know, it, it's trying to be in alignment with what, quote unquote, God is, uh, is is like just getting into the Gulf Stream and let the Gulf Stream take you instead of trying to swim across it and then you're going to battle, you're going to struggle. You'll make it, but it's just going to be so difficult to do it. But if you just get into that flow state, that place where where you just you you just allow the natural way things go to just move you along and I need to think of a reason for people to drink now because that's probably like what? What's this guy talking? <laughs> no, about? I think I think what you have to have the confidence in is that you, this is something that you believe yourself. And then when people see the way you live your life and how you've been able to live your life in a way that's in harmony with nature mm -hmm. and with the universe and things are working out for you, then they're going to say, well, there must be something to what Desmond is saying because, you know, he seems to have put himself in that flow. And, you know, I you know, like the way his, his, his life has turned out and, and and I and I think they'll like if your life was a mess, they'd be like, well, you know, you keep talking about this flow, but you know, you're <laughs> you're, yeah. pa you're panhandling under the bridge. So I don't see yeah. where that the Never correlation. <laughs> Yeah, no, you're right. It it is like that. Um, but I I also know that you know storms come up. That's a natural order of things. There are disruptive storms yep. that, regardless of how in flow you are, they're going to disrupt things for a while. But that is also part of the natural progression of things. You know, we're in South Florida, you get hurricanes. And honestly, that, that clears out a lot of old dead stuff, which it's it, now, of course, we have houses in the way. So yeah. it becomes catastrophic. But back, you know, without houses, without us, it, it, it was important to clear those things out. And, and otherwise, I, I know in I know in California, when you get a brush fire, I know a lot of the problem is that we now don't let we fires don't burn, let brush yeah. fires burn. Yeah. So you get this this floor of dry tinder mm -hmm. in this forest. And then when there actually is a fire, it's an inferno. So whereas 300, 400 years ago, a fire would start, it would burn until, you know, it just went out. Yeah, because uh, nature has a way of doing its thing, mm -hmm. it, it, whether we are here or not. And it's going to keep doing its thing for the next millions of years, whether we're here or not. So the fact that, that there are now houses on land, nature still has to go through its cycles. I mean, look at the top of a tor of a tornado or a hurricane. It's a Fibonacci spiral again. It is. Like, oh. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it, it exists everywhere. And so there's a there's a a reason why, why it's happening and and like you said everything is everything like for me everything is a cycle like sometimes there are cycles that last seconds sometimes there are cycles that last years decades centuries right but i feel like there's always like a beginning and an end to everything and so that's kind of like why, why sort of like how I, I i live my life where i'm, I'm always thinking okay this this is going to start and this is going to end there's going to be a high there's going to be a low and and i think it helps to put things into perspective especially when you're going through a sort of a dip in your life and you feel like, oh, is, is this going to end? And I always feel it is. And I just, sometimes I, it's hard to see when, but I, I, it's comforting to know that there'll be a, a another restart to, to cycle, if you will. Yeah, definitely. That's a great attitude to have because you, you, you can, you can just roll with things. And, and I talk about this stuff a lot on my podcast. So I just love, that's why <laughs> It seems like I've just gravitated. As soon as you said Fibonacci, I was like, oh, is there something spiritual? Do you really think that there's something there? Does it change the course of your life based on whether you're utilizing this or not? I think so. Uh, okay. Yeah. That's good. All right. Depends on, <laughs> yeah. It's a in very interesting book. It's very esoteric, but it's called The Flower of Life if you want to get down a super deep rabbit hole. but <laughs> Yeah. It, yeah. Starts, it starts with the premise of sacred geometry and explains why certain symbols have had certain meanings. And, and then if you go... There's pictures of like the uh, the pyramids in Egypt, and you see like a flower of life symbol on a on a structure that was built, you know, oh, tens yeah. of thousands of years ago. And you're like, wait, they knew about it back then too. Yeah. So well, the it, aliens it, told them. It, well, 
Oh, there's another one we're gonna go. <laughs> oh, it's a whole nother topic. Let's save yeah, that. We'll one. have to start a whole new podcast for that one. I think it's called um George Norrie's uh yeah. what's the yeah, I forget what it's called. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Art Bell used to do it. Yeah, Art Bell. I used to be fascinated by that stuff. Oh, I would love to do a podcast like that, <laughs> whether I believed all the stuff or not. I, well, just just, love I love getting people on the, I love getting uh, free thinkers into a conversation mm-hmm. on that stuff because you just, sometimes you just have to sit back and listen and be open mm-hmm. to the possibility that there's a small percentage of what they said is true. And it's just like, oh, that's nice. Interesting. Yeah, 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 it's hard. I I love asking questions. Yeah. I well, love it's, asking it, questions. It's I think a lot of people are afraid to ask questions because they think they might come across as silly or ignorant or dumb. And mm-hmm. I think if more people ask more questions, there, there's this inherent innocence when we're young. And what I've heard, it's you know, the first seven years when, when kids are born, they just, it just naturally, like, they want to know everything, right? Yeah. Um, and if, and if you believe in rebirth, then they're just, they're coming off like this cycle where they're, maybe they're starting to forget as soon as they're born, but like the kind of, you know, where they, you know, where they came from and, and then, the, but they still have that innocence of like, you know, everything is magical. And you've, you've heard some little kids sometimes say some things that you're just like, how do you know that? Like, why do you say that? And you're speaking like an 80 year old man. It, you're really, really crazy. And I'm fascinated by that sort of stuff because I think there's some, there's something to that, right? Maybe that's the reason babies can't talk because they would freak us out because we haven't piled all the crap from life on them yet. Yes. We got to wait and wait until they get just piled on with emotion and debris and life. And now you can speak to us because now we'll actually relate to what you're saying. But if they in a pure state just born, if they yeah. were to just share what their <laughs> spirit knows, yeah. oh, my gosh, we'd be like, you are weird. Yeah, well, they'll, so. <laughs> that, that, um, I picture them. It's almost like coming out of a, like a spiritual water slide. Like they're just mm. hitting, and they're just like, you'll never guess where <laughs> I just came from. It was so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that, this is awesome. I'm good. That is a quote for your show. It's birth is like coming off of a spiritual water slide. Every mother who has ever had a baby says it is not at all like yeah. a water slide. <laughs> okay. I am sure. But yeah, the, the, the thought of that is really uh, brings a yeah, smile to my face. But yeah, I think uh, we just have to have. I think the way to tie this all together is just to have an open mind, you know, not yeah. and to understand that we don't need to like answer these questions here and to be open to people who have different perspectives uh, on life. And, and you mentioned the podcast and, and it's interesting that you've decided to touch on that topic because I, I'll just read what you have on your website that your mission is to help your life, uh, to help make your life more abundant and with greater purpose so you can achieve your maximum potential. And so, so I'm wondering if you think about the arc of, uh, what we talked about with your life early on, when did this theme start to emerge in your life that, as something that you wanted to dig, uh, you know, dig a bit deeper on? So this will go all the way back to the, that scrawny little kid who was just kind of didn't fit in, which means I sometimes dealt with a lot of pain in life because I was always looking for identity. I was always looking to figure out where do I fit? Where do I belong? I'm not a jock. I, I love music, but I can't play. I, I I was really good at thinking of band names, but after that, I was out. And uh, <laughs> and and so I spent this time trying to figure out things. I went through I went through a long time. I became a born again Christian at 18 years old, and uh, that that also came out of that that strong desire to find purpose and reason for life. Um, and then along that path and through that journey, I started, oh, I love asking questions. So I, I'm always wanting to know why, why, like you said about a five, six, seven year old, why, why mom, why, 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 why? Well, I go into libraries or onto the web now and ask that same thing. Why, 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 why? And, and I don't shut off to things except dogma. I don't like dogma. I don't like somebody. You had said, you had mentioned that, um, that dogma or that um, we're afraid to ask questions because we don't want to seem dumb. I yeah. think that we're more likely to seem dumb when we don't ask questions, when we're not open to the possibility of other answers when we have that dogma. So I, I kind of move away from that and it, it can get you into trouble, but um, 
I, I read a lot of self-help books. You know what? <laughs> this would be a whole other area we could jump into. But uh, when I was 18, I got involved in multi-level marketing. I got involved in Amway back in the day. Like three times over, I was in and then out. And then I quit and I got in again. And I quit and I got in. And then my sister hit me. I was like, wow, my sister's doing it. must be legit. legit. I, I respect her. So <laughs> so I was out and in and out and in. But, but through all that, I started reading a lot of self-help books. Magic Thinking Big, uh, you know, the, the Magic of Believing, uh, Thinking and grow rich all the classics um back when i was reading them they weren't classics though they were new no they weren't yeah. uh, they were they're still classics but so so i started reading all that stuff and i started finding some potential answers in all that and um it, it comes out of my frustration with not knowing where i belong and where i fit because again remember i was a performer so I was I was wanting to do magic, but I had stage fright because I wasn't confident, so I couldn't perform. And of course, my dad comes out of the depression, so he says, oh, "You got to get a good job." So I joined the Navy, and I spent four years in the Navy, and it was just I know Harry, you're looking, you're like, "Oh my gosh, this guy." <laughs> no, it, no, I mean, I, but I think it's interesting because everything that we do and every action we've taken and everything that we've tried, sort of is like this mosaic pattern of mm -hmm. our personality and you would not be who you are now if it hadn't been you'd be a different person if you hadn't had those four years in the navy oh yeah absolutely so, yeah, totally. so every every little thing even the thing you know the, mm -hmm. especially the things we try and we we know that we don't like we know that in the future we're not going to try something like that so it's just i and i think a lot of people are afraid to try because they're afraid to fail Mm -hmm. yep. or they have an instant visceral reaction to something where it's like, I'm not a Navy guy. Like, what am I going to be doing there? So I just really applaud people who like to, for whatever reason, whether you wanted to try the Navy or not, or whether, you know, your parents said you're going to the Navy. That's it. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> and I imagine that's what happened, but it's still like looking, and I'm sure looking back on it, you can sort of appreciate the experience for, for what you, you got out of it. Yeah, I think you hit on something I never thought of before. Um, you said that it's afraid we're afraid to fail, so we don't try things. I think I did a lot of what I did early in life because I didn't want to fail because I was already the. And I, I'm not trying to be self-deprecating. I honestly was the little kid in the neighborhood who was last on the backstop. Don't. I'm not asking for pity. It's just the reality. I mean, it's just I wasn't physically big, you know. Um, so I. I depended on others to tell me what my best course of action was. So a lot of people made decisions for me, my parents, mm. teachers, even though I was rebellious in school, I just knew this undercurrent of like, if my dad came home and this, you almost nailed it. Exactly. I'm laying on the couch, got a bag of chips on my stomach. My dad's an army ROTC teacher in high school. Okay. So I'm sitting there I'm laying there, got the remote in my hand. I'm looking over the TV, eating, <laughs> eating chips. My dad walks in, he's a school teacher. So he gets out shortly after I get out of school, different school, and um, walks in. And all he says is, the Navy recruiter should be calling you in about 15 minutes. And I just looked over the other direction. And I went, oh, OK. <laughs> and that's how it happened. That was it. And four years of my life. And but thankfully, because honestly, I mean, I was a stoner. I was I grew up in, you know, I was just was just doing all the things I shouldn't have done. Not nothing really, really bad, just smoking a lot. And um, and so it was good because it gave me four years of semi sobriety where I could really think about what I wanted to do in life. And I still hadn't figured it out, but it did give me like a nice time out on all the crazy partying stuff. So. What what was one of the interesting lessons, maybe looking back now, that you learned as a result of being in the Navy? Don't yeah, I was I, I, I just it, it's easier to go along and get along like authority dealing with authority. I was rebellious in high school. Um, I wasn't I wasn't uh, you know I wasn't I was like a D student, but when I got into college, I was an A student because I you know then I actually was there because I wanted to be. Um, so um, I'm not dumb like everybody thinks <laughs> i uh i'm smart <laughs> um yeah drink and so um yeah it, it's it's follow authority and just realizing that see in high school the consequence was detention in the navy the consequence was the brig or uh dishonorable discharge so in high school it was kind of like eh, eh, so what i gotta go to saturday school so what i gotta go to summer school yeah big deal Whatever, it's four hours a day. No problem. Navy, it was a little bit different. Um, you know, the consequence was much higher. There's something I learned about the Navy as I got older. I didn't realize this. 
my dad wanted one of he he went to sea when he was 14 he grew up in liverpool england poor broke like the poor liverpool's a broke like blue collar town um but he was a broke the worst in the neighborhood is what he always said of course we always had the was, worst. what was the timing on that relative to the beatles, oh, the beatles fame yeah he's he was born in 25 so um yeah, he he was. Uh, yeah, they, he was an old man. He yelled at them to get off his lawn. <laughs> hey, you kids with the guitars, get off! You my guys lawn. will never amount to anything. <laughs> so yeah, you know it's kind of cool to say Liverpool and the Beatles and everything, Beatles and all that. But they, uh, yeah, there was no overlap. He went to sea when he was fourteen. He became a merchant marine. He just wanted to get out of the house because the house sucked really bad. You know, his dad was real stern. Um, so he wanted one, and he then grew up. He was an army. RTC. He grew up. He was an Army RTC teacher, ultimately, when I would graduate high school. He really wanted one of his kids to be a mariner, like go to sea, like, you know, and and I, here was the little stoner, loser, long hair. I had long hair then. And, uh, you know, and, and I'm going to go in the Navy. And I think he had such high hopes for me. So I'm in San Diego and the Navy's dumb the way they do things. So I'm in San Diego, right? There's probably no more Navy town in the world than San Diego. So where do they send me to boot camp? Not San Diego, where they have a boot camp. No, they sent me to Orlando, Florida. Oh, my God. Uh, and I can explain why I was born. But anyway, so I'm in Orlando. And so I go to my Navy graduation, which, you know, I'm not realizing it's a big deal. My dad flies out, takes off work. He comes out to Navy graduation. I you know, march on the parade ground. My dad's there. It's going to make me cry and because uh, my dad's not with us anymore. So I can't let him know that I appreciate all that stuff now anyway all right moving on and so uh and and here's what this young dumb jerk me did drink and uh i i my dad comes all the way out and there was this cute girl in the other company you know the other navy company and i really want and this was our first freedom you know we, like you graduate and you get the weekend off and so you've been locked up for eight weeks and so i said to my dad Hey, do you mind if I, what a jerk. My dad comes out, he celebrates his son, finally a sailor in the family. And I'm just like, Hey dad, well, I don't even remember that girl's name anymore. Right. And oh, I just wanted to go out and have some beers with her or something like that. Cause she was just really, just ridiculous. Um, and that's some, so that's something I learned through the Navy, but later, like, man, my dad wanted something there. There was something there that my dad really, really wanted. And I missed it at the time. But I think there's there's an aspect to this that there's almost the other side of the coin. It's sometimes parents have this desire to have their child live a life that maybe they couldn't live. Yep. And yeah. obviously, there's there's an aspect of that there. So and then there's and then there's the we can get Freuding, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know, like uh, wanting to make your dad happy, and there's, yeah. there's a lot of things that happen. So, but. I think, and I would, I would say that you did the best that you could under the, the given circumstances. Yeah, still the best. Still might you might you might do your best, and you get all the way up to the level of jerk. Still, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, jerk son who like wanted to go see. <laughs> so, so yeah, it is the best, but it was still subpar. I think. So, um, I think we, about we, that. We have to stumble and fall, right? Yeah, and so that pain taught me some things, and. Um, Unfortunately, it taught me that a little bit later, so I could. But yeah, I, I guess I have regrets about it, but I make the best of what happened in that situation. It also speaks in the fact that I think my dad had a lot of nostalgia about the Navy, you know, he because it got him out of the house. He mm -hmm. found his freedom in the Navy, and he was in the Merchant Marines, the Royal Navy, and all that before he came over and um, joined the U.S. Army. Um, but yeah, he found his freedom in that, and I think there was a lot of, he was on the Queen Mary, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah, man, I feel like I got 47. This should be this episode should be called 47 million stories from one guy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he was on the Queen Mary. And when, I remember we went to Long Beach and went, went to see the Queen Mary. We were up on the bridge and they have under glass a log book in there. And my dad's looking and he's just, he's like, hey, this was when, hey, hey, it was his name in the log book that they had opened up, written in there. He used to paint those smokestacks on the Queen Mary. Oh, um, wow. So, yeah, while you're at sea. So you tie a rope to the top while you're at sea. Okay. So you're trying to paint and you're going back and forth. Wow. <laughs> you're just like get a few strokes in and then back. <laughs> so uh, crazy stuff, man. They painted that ship gray during the war so that it was harder to see. Wow. fascinating fact very Move interesting, very interesting. <laughs> no it's all interesting it's all 
I, I, like I said, like we talked about the mosaic, the tapestry, like it's all the things that color your recollections of stories your father told you. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's what I am now. I'm looking at you and I, I don't know. I'm you're, you're younger than me, but I feel like now I am that old man down the street who tells funny stories, I'm 45. Like weird stories. Oh, I'm 49. Okay. Oh, you look <laughs> fantastic. No, I'm not coming on to you, Harry. So <laughs> no, it's, uh, it, yeah, I feel like I'm kind of that old man down the street who's like got the, or the guy at the end of the bar, the old man. And he's like, ah, let me tell you about when I was a kid <laughs> and we had spirographs back then. That's what we played with. Yeah. Those fancy iPads. You yeah. guys have <laughs> kids off my lawn you just come to appreciate the older generation as you get older and hopefully you can communicate to the younger generation the messages in a way that doesn't come across as um you know like you're talking down to them yeah. or, or trying to instill authority or trying to say in my day you know you always know you're getting older when you're like well mm -hmm. you know in my day or an example yeah. of something that used to happen in your era and you're like ah i can't believe i actually said that and, but yeah yeah you hear it don't you once in a while you'll just hear yeah. yourself say it and you're like oh did i say that wow that's crazy i try to be really i don't know about you, you you're young in spirit as well um and i try to be that way um and i'm always trying to be open that's why i'm podcasting at 49 years old there's probably a lot of 49 year olds are probably like well, I don't know what you kids are doing with your podcasts, you know? That's that's the way they think about it. My granddaughters want to vlog. So, yeah, we're going to vlog. It's going to be fun. And, uh, you know, it'll, we'll just embrace it all. How much of everything that you've learned and, and, the, and the things we've talked about continue to infuse what you're doing with your show? Everything. Yeah. Everything. The show's Mental Mastery Monday. So, um, yeah, I know you read my mission statement, um, but... The, the podcast that the, the subtitle of it is changing the world changing the world within you by changing the world around you did I get it backwards no I think I, heard. <laughs> I only say it every time um so it, I really realize through all of these stories that I've that I've shared that um so much of what I've spent my life trying to do is change the world around me so I'm trying to change um, my job. I'm trying to change careers and I'm trying to, you know, change you know, what I eat or what I do or what I read and all that in a, in the hope that it will change who's inside of me, what I feel inside of me. Um, and I've realized late in life, um, later in life, it's not late yet. Right, Harry? Not at all. Come on. Reassure me. Okay. So I realized that I, I was working backwards. You got to live inside out. You got to go into changing inside of you. And then all that junk around you will start to change. It's not instant. That's the frustrating thing. Really good changes. You know, this is what my latest episode's about. Like real happiness comes from the hard habits that you build. Uh, we have bad habits. Like I use an example of the habit of like, I want to be happy. I want to eat something that tastes really good. So I hit the drive through And some days, you know, you, it's lunchtime. So you're just out of a habit. You jump in the car and you go to the drive through You don't even think about it. Or maybe it's getting that mocha latte swirl chocolate thing, you know, uh, every morning. You don't even think about it. You just do it. But the real happiness, the real good feelings in life come when we... Um, when we are diligent and intentional about creating long-term habits and we forget about the instant gratification. And then those feelings, uh, those good feelings, because when you drink that mocha, whatever, uh, it tastes delicious. When you have that Big Mac you bite into and you get those salty, crispy fries, especially when they're fresh, that, that tastes good. There's no denying it. I'm sure heroin feels phenomenal to a heroin addict, right? Uh, so, but, but, but when you when you go against that and you just are disciplined, and you reach the root that the lasting effect of those French fries, once they're gone, they're gone. You know, it's it. The happiness is over. But when you're disciplined and you're intentional, the happiness extends out for a long time. And if you keep it up, then you can you can get it rolling. You know, you get the momentum going in that area and you feel really, really good for a long time. What's the response to the show, Ben? It's a, it's such a powerful message. I imagine there's been instances where it's really resonated with your listeners and with your fans to the extent that mm -hmm. they just have to let you know that it, it's it's affected a change in their life. That's so. That's what keeps you. You know this probably as well. That's what keeps you going is uh, just getting those reviews or getting an email, especially when you get an email from somebody. So I started my show doing it daily. 
and I burned out and I, I, I it was, it's hard, man. It's hard to do a daily show. Right. Uh, and so you, you end up, I burned out. And so I stopped for a while and then I started again and then I stopped again. And it seemed like each time I would get an email from somebody saying, Hey, I noticed you stopped at episode 127. I, I'm like, your show's really great. And it's changed my life in so many ways. Are you going to do more? And I'll be like, Oh, then I have this obligation. Like I'm an empathetic person. So I, I, you know, I'm always trying to minimize other people's pain. It costs me pain sometimes. But, um, so I, I, uh, I, and then I go, okay, I got to get back. This person needs me. I mean, they need me. I've got to fix things for them. So I would start doing it again. I just saw, and I wish I had it in front of me, somebody who had emailed me about finding my show on iHeartRadio on the iHeartRadio app and they started off with your show has saved my life wow. what wow. <laughs> my show uh and so i i yeah i screenshotted that and and uh shared it and and just was very candid about the fact that all of us as podcasters um don't realize that our message resonates with somebody it's it's that person out there so i started started doing it again yeah that's huge right that's that's what we podcast for yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's just, you know, for self-aggrandizement. So I can say, look at me, I'm at the top of iTunes. Not that I've ever been able to say that, but, you know, we got to hope for something. I, I think I would argue that getting an email like that is 10 times, 100 times better than being on some top of some stupid arbitrary chart. So I have to take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree with you, man. I, I, I do. I totally agree with you. And, and that's the profound thing. You know, and I've made such wonderful friends, you included, that, that I've got a friend over in England who started listening to my show. And he talks about addiction um, and he does some live stuff. And I've been on his show a couple of times. I'm just fascinated with it. And I know I'm going to end up over in England at some point. And we're gonna get together and hang yeah. out. Uh, probably not have a beer because he deals with you know addiction. So, <laughs> so but that would be, whatever. That would be awkward. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, here in England, you gotta have a pint. Yeah. So, um, well, so, maybe yeah. well, maybe we can tie it into uh, like an NMA, uh, New Media Europe or something like that. Uh, I, I want to get over there as well. So. Oh, I, I'll tell you. See, I applied for that to speak at that one this year, but I haven't really made a big effort into being a speaker. You know, I spoke at Podfest in Tampa. And I'm gonna speak again in uh, Orlando in February. So. Uh, I'm excited about that, but I haven't really made this strong push to speak, but that's really when it comes down to it. I'm 49 now. And I think through the radio, through the magic, through the podcasting, through all that, what I really want to do, and this is what it all comes down to me, uh, for it with me, whatever I, I am a communicator for a living. Uh, so even though I can't. Um, <laughs> edit. And, um, so I, I want to be on stage and I want to affect people's lives in a positive way, whether that's being silly and goofy and making them laugh and forget about the problems at home for a little while, or getting them to go deep into themselves to figure out why the world around them is not the way they want it to be. Uh, whatever that is, I want it, maybe a combination of both. Um, that's what I want to do. I watched last night. I watched the Tony Robbins documentary on Netflix. Have you watched it yet? No, I haven't seen that. Is that oh new my? Or? God. It just came out last Wednesday. Wow, it's phenomenal, right? Gotta see, and gotta it, see that. I watched it, and my wife kind of got. She's not really into that personal development stuff as much. She got sucked in, and she's just sitting there. And all of a sudden, she's on the couch, and then there's a blanket on, and she's like, Phew. "I'm like, yeah, she's in." <laughs> and so she watched this thing. It's fantastic because he takes you through his whole date with destiny thing, which I haven't done. It was a really intense six day, twelve hours a day kind of in depth. I mean, wow. it's wild. Highly recommend it. But when I got done watching that, I didn't say it to my wife because I didn't want to be, you know, like I said, that's what I'm supposed to do. That right there, maybe not copying him, but that kind of thing—that life change stuff for people. Weird, huh? Well, I think that's good of, as good of a place as any to uh, <laughs> to wrap up at least this version of your story. And and if you, you thought you were going to come on and, and disappoint people because we were going to have nothing to talk about, then uh, I, I hope you understand the power of storytelling, the power of interesting lives, and the power that you have to affect other people's lives for the good. Well, you're you made it easy, Harry. So uh, that 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 may that helped, and your smile, and you you're just receptive to all of my forty seven billion stories from an old man at the end of the bar. I'm telling you, if I don't see that title on this episode, I'm be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Well, thanks for titling my episode. That's really helpful. Going to sa <laughs> save me a little bit of time there. So, no worries. All and, right, Harry. Uh, so uh, I appreciate the time, and and where can folks track you down? 
P. Desmond Adams everywhere. I, I even had business cards made up. All they're black, and they say P. Desmond Adams at the top, and then it says Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. dot com. I said everywhere. It's P. Desmond Adams. So very go. good. Well, I encourage. You listening to check out the podcast? I think if this interview is any indication, then you're going to be highly entertained and、right. uh, educated as well, and and inspired. So hopefully, we get some new listeners shooting your way. Yeah, Mental Mastery Mondays. Bring a shot glass.、It'll、be plenty of opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for your thanks, time,、sir. and thanks for being so open. I appreciate it.、Mm, my pleasure. You know what's so funny is that Desmond was really giving me a hard time because I was—I had originally asked him to be on, and he said, "Oh, why, why would you want to talk to me?" And really, really humble,、uh, a bit self-deprecating. And I was trying to figure out why why he was doing that, or if that that was a front, or it's just his personality. And through the course of the conversation, I realized that he's just really humble. And sincere, and a great human being, and you can feel the emotion in some of the things he talked about. You know, when he was talking about his father and、uh, the important life lessons he learned from him, and you know, we just went into you know random topics like magic, and I just like to find ways to connect with guests, and I I'm I'm confident that there's always something, this little thread sometimes, and maybe this huge tapestry of things that connect us to our fellow human beings if we just look hard enough, or 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 if we just listen, right? You know, we'll find something that we have in common with folks that we think、um, are completely different from us and are on the opposite side of the spectrum on many topics. So, I think if more of us did that, if we if we looked for ways to connect. In a way that's meaningful and sincere, we'd have a lot more interesting conversations in this world. So, thanks for listening. I'm glad to be getting、uh, back into a, a bit of a rhythm here. It's、uh, a little bit delayed here in, in terms of getting the season two off, and it's. I think it's just a function of、um, not having. Not that I didn't have episodes recorded, but in true peek behind the curtain fashion, I. Didn't get my intros recorded. I literally have like five more episodes ready to go, and it's just from a planning perspective. And one of those things, one of those things that pops up for podcasters now and then. I had some travel going on. We've got a little issue going on with our little friend at home, our Yorkie Disco.、Uh, we had one of those crazy tough conversations about whether it was time for him to go, and lots of tears. <laughs> and uh, thankfully, uh, we adjusted his medication. He was kept overnight in an oxygen tank, and、uh, that's not cheap, by the way. <laughs> But、uh, I'm happy to say that he's here, and he's going to be here for a little while longer. So we don't have any kids, so that's、uh, making us really, really happy. And he's usually my trusted companion as I record these intros and outros here in the office, sitting by my side. So any of you who have pets, I'm sure, can relate. So you know, lots of life things. That come up and、uh, sort sort of throw you for a loop, and a little bit of that was going on, but that's not the only reason I'm looking to get back on on track, and I'm happy to do so. So we are a member of Podcastica. Check out the other shows in the network at podcastica.com. Walking Deadcast under the comic covers,、uh, Ron Dawson's Radio Film School, the One Mind Podcast to get your meditation on, the Game of Microphones.、Uh, that's coming up soon. I think October it starts again, or is that Walking Dead? I get confused. The podcast producers and Once Upon a Podcast and Evil Dead Cast, check out those shows and、uh, let us know if you're digging them because、uh, the hosts would like to know. I'll pass the word on. The music is brought to you by Cedar and Soil. Thanks to my great friend George Abiana. Check him out at cedarsoil.com. I've got one call to action today, and、uh, it's going to be to engage with the show through Speakpipe. You may not even know that if you go to the site, there's a little tab on the right that says "Send Voicemail." I should probably change that because it's not as intuitive now that I'm on the site and I'm literally looking at it.、Uh, I haven't gotten a lot in the past, but I think for this one call to action, that's all. If you've listened to the show, if you're a friend of the show, if you know me personally, if you don't know me personally, if this is your first time, if this is your hundred and third time,、uh, leave me a note. Let me know what you think,、uh, and I'll grab a couple of snippets and I'll start playing them at the end of the show. So it's the Send Voicemail. 
send voicemail tab to the right of the screen on podcastjunkies.com. That's the only thing you really need to worry about. So with, with all the work that I've done for the show, it's been two plus two plus years of putting, putting it together. And a lot of times it's been a lot of late nights and fellow podcasters can relate to that. And so I think what was interesting is the limits or that we're willing to go to to get episodes out. And then we get frustrated in the beginning because we don't know where to distribute it. So I'm happy to report a new sponsor for the show. It's actually a project of mine. It's called PodFunnel. You can check it out at podfunnel.com, P-O-D-F-U-N-N-E-L. Uh, dot com and really the objective is to save you time the whole reason i created it is so that podcasters can f- wrap up a little bit early and, and spend some have, spend dinner time with their family or go play catch with their son or take their daughter to the ballet and uh, you know these are things that are podcasters we don't really think about when we look at the benefits of services we th- we think about you know what you know was the, what's the widget they have or what's the feature they have and I really th- think what resonates with me is, you know, how can it make your life better? And I, and I think really that's the objective here. And I'm looking for um, some feedback and I'm in the process of getting people to sign up. So it's really just a matter of getting your invitation at this point. So head on over to the site um, and leave your email address and, and I'll start to continue conversations with you about what is in the works and start sharing some, some behind the scenes screens of, of what it's going to look like. But this is something I want to grow with podcasters because I'm I'm a podcaster and I've got a great podcast network and a great podcast family. So um, if you think that might be helpful, check it out, podfunnel.com. So if you made it this far, then you're probably interested in the retention hashtag. Uh, so I think we're going to do something related to mental mastery. And this time I'll just think it up on the spot. If it's uh, Desmond, it's P. Desmond. I just think of this and they bring a smile to my face. Uh, P. Mastery. Um, hashtag P mastery. I don't think that's a very popular hashtag, so it'll be interesting. P M A S T E R Y and tag myself podcast underscore junkies and tag Desmond at P Desmond Adams. And let us know that you made it this far. Thanks as always. I love you guys for listening, for commenting, for engaging on Twitter, for watching my podcast junkies, junkies, uh, r- rambles uh, on the Facebook group. If you haven't joined, you can check that out. And uh, stay tuned for next week. We have an interesting conversation with Mr. Stefan Spencer. Really interesting. I wasn't expecting where that was going to go, and that's been happening a lot lately. So uh, I think you're going to like uh, the fact that we touch into uh, something related to his trip to India and his relationship with Tony Robbins. Exciting stuff. Have a fantastic day.